Welcome, and welcome to Move to Learn, which is the Handspring webinar series for manual therapists and movement educators. Today we celebrate, we celebrate the opening of our second season, fall 2021, and we celebrate the publication of the second edition of Joanne Avison's Yoga, Fascia, Anatomy, and Movement. Joanne has prepared a unique um, experience for you today, uh, combining her extensive interdisciplinary experience as a yoga teacher, a yoga therapist, a teacher of embryology, and an author. Prior to meeting Joanne, let's take a look at how things work. Most importantly, I would like to suggest that you have your, your uh, movement props, your sensory props at hand. Please come prepared for a movement experience, specifically a movement and sensory experience. So reach for some chocolate. I went shopping yesterday for a high quality chocolate bar that's made in Belgium. Stay tuned because Joanne has expertise in Belgium chocolate. In addition to chocolate, you will also have a ball, a ball that fits easily in the palm of your hand, any size depending on the palm shape of your hand. You will also make use of a sock. Ah, the plot thickens. What could possibly involve a sock? And just in case for the pandemic, you have some surgical gloves that will be fine as well. So now you know what to bring for your movement and sensory experience. We'll remind you that the webinar will comprise roughly 45 minutes discussion, presentation, and guided practice. We'll follow that by 15 minutes of Q&A. So when you have a question, uh, please do note it in the Q&A. The chat is on, so please do say hello and tell us where you're joining from. We will aim to finish the webinar promptly on the hour. However, um, if, there, if there are some questions remaining when we get to the hour, um, Joe will be available to speak for about another 10 minutes. The webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link to it in the follow-up email. So just in case you don't have your favorite chocolate available, of course, you could watch the webinar on YouTube in perpetuity and enjoy each bite of chocolate. We'll just bring to your attention our disclaimer that this discussion is for informational and illustrative purposes only and is not meant to impart medical or therapeutic advice or instruction. Now, let me give you some background about uh, Joanne Avison, the author of the first and, of course, now second edition of Yoga, Fascia, Anatomy, and Movement. Joanne Avison has been studying meditation and practicing meditation since age 16. She brings to her professional experience a variety of interdisciplinary uh, accomplishments. Um, she has a master's in spiritual science, is now working on her doctorate in spiritual science with a focus on sound yoga. Uh, Joanne was one of the first people to train in the Thomas Myers School of Kinetic Manual Therapy and a kinetic manual practitioner, and she has worked as a structural integrator, both as a practitioner and as a teacher. She also has the highest credentials in yoga therapy and also yoga teaching. Joanne, welcome. Welcome to Move to Learn. Thank you, Elizabeth. Such a pleasure to be here. And as it's always been a pleasure to be an author with Handspring. Um, I remember the very first time I met Serena. So thank you yeah. for the invitation. Yes, Joe, we see that you have um, in your, your meditation room, you have your two books, the first and second edition. I'm so amazed by the transformation from the first to the second. 
And uh, would you would you speak about uh, how you chose what to put in the book? Well, that's wow! What a question. Um, if I'm really honest, I think when I wrote the first edition, I at the time I had been working with Tom Myers for several years, and then I was uh, facilitating Robert Schleip's work in the UK, and we're talking early two thousands. Um, and Robert and Serena approached me about writing the first book and I became very excited about it and went down all sorts of rabbit holes, you can imagine. And Serena very lovingly and firmly reined me in. And we decided that because of my experience as a in human dissection, we've done a, many hundreds and hundreds of hours of human dissection and um, understanding of anatomy, but being in, in so deeply into yoga as well as structural integration, that writing a book that incorporated all of them but explained the fascia um, would be really valuable because of my experience in both the manual and the movement fields. And I also brought in the yoga because it gave me permission to refer to the spirit, which I felt was really important. It was part of my studies by that time. But I have to be really honest with you, Elizabeth, I was boxing above my academic weight when I brought this first edition together. I had assistance from some of the world's leading protagonists, not least of whom were Robert Schleip, Professor Daryl Evans, um, Yap van der Waal, uh, Dr. Stephen Levin in Tensegrity. And I began to pull together this picture because I'd studied the geometry of consciousness for years. But I was absolutely staggered to discover that the geometry of living form matches the geometry of consciousness. So I just went out there looking and I discovered the theological seminary that I'm now part of. And when it came to writing the second edition, I had so much more confidence because in the interim, uh, I met and started to work with John Sharkey who, as you know, is a clinical anatomist, and he facilitated where I believe we met um, the, the biotensegrity led teal soft fixed dissection. So my experience to that point had been in uh, formalin dissection. And I tease John, I call him JTB, John the Baptist, because he baptized me in the lab. I found myself teaching, not learning, which was what I was expecting. And um, so basically the things I suspected, the things I wondered about, the things I was very curious about and had asked questions about in the first edition came to life for me in the second. I actually had the confidence to really say with some five, six years solid experience that this was not just my idea with some good research behind it, but this was now researched, um, demonstrable, repeatable, and I had a stack of experience behind me to suggest that what's in the second edition is more confident and also chapter seven called Fascial Architecture was a dive into the work I'd done for a long time regarding water and Gerald Polak's work and May Wan Ho's work and I was able to bring them together and make sense of the liquid crystal nature of the fascia. I don't know if that helps, but it's what happened. Always fascinating, uh, really, uh, to hear about the the author's journey, because uh, to to birth a book, and then in your case to birth a second edition, uh, one goes through through some dark places before Tell emerging <laughs> into a into a publication. Now you mentioned your work in dissection. Um, with a number of the uh, the leading uh, dissection uh, um, educators, uh, would you use this as a um, as a bridge or a segue into today's topic about uh, the hands and the transformative movement experiences of the hands? I'd be absolutely delighted. So one of the things in the book um, was the the original design in the first edition at the front, and it was before I had even seen Martha Graham do anything vaguely similar, um, but was seeking to show what I'd seen in Jean-Claude Gambetto's videos and saw, uh, I think you were with me when he first came to the Dundee laboratory with his endoscope and was able to go everywhere in the body, was that the body is formed under tension. 
everything in the human body is under tension at all times. And our classical biomechanics describes us as if we are compression systems. We talk about the spinal column, for example. But what we know from embryology and from our understanding of soft fixed teal and Jean-Claude Gamberteau's work with an endoscopic camera is everything in the body is formed under tension. So tension is the missing aspect of classical biomechanics. It's based on compression and we are a tension compression architecture. Now, this is deeply reflected in yoga in that yoga always talks about Ida, Pingala, and when they come together and they are unified, Shushumna, Sushumna arises spontaneously. So when we're talking about structure, we're talking about the tension, the compression, and how they combine to form the volume that we are. And as soon as we see the body in the dissection laboratory, and I have the great good fortune to, to, to work with uh, John Sharkey, in, he's a clinical anatomist, which means he has to know every part of the body, not just the fascia, but how it behaves right down through bones, through vessels, through minutiae, and also he's a, an exercise physiologist, so how it translates into movement. So one of my fascinations was when I studied embryology with Professor Darrell Evans and Yarp van der Waal was discovering that embryologically we form through the fabric of the tissue of the fascia. We create our tissues, we create our architecture out of this fascial fabric. We, we, we create it and then we use it to form ourselves. And how I say that is that we are the architect that self assembles the architecture Joanne, through which to express um, ourselves as the architect. The, these concepts are so rich and evoke so much, uh, so much imagery. How about going to some of the slides of the images from your book um, to illustrate uh, what you're telling Perfectly. us? Perfectly, yeah. I was just about to ask Hilary if she would show the first slide, which was created as a visual metaphor for what we mean by something being under tension. So we're sort of playing with the idea that this transparent fabric through which light can move is tensioned, as I've said, but in a volume. As I said, Ida Pingala, Sushumna arises, tension compression, volume arises in round forms. We're not 2D flat pack kitchens, we're multi-dimensional round forms. And this image is created to give the impression of how light, how sound, how resonance can move through the tissue. And it's a metaphor, a visual metaphor for what's going on inside the body. Now, to take that into the embryo, if we can see the next slide, please, Hilary. This is a drawing of the embryological form. And we have to get to this a little bit if we imagine that we form ourselves as the heart begins first. And I love knowing that as a heart-centered practitioner, as someone who teaches from a heart-centered place, I love knowing that the very immature heart cells begin above the crown. And in order for us to see how the hands develop, we have to appreciate that the heart starts beating above the crown, rounds down until it's put in a place by the growing brain that pushes it down, opposite what we would call in yoga the fourth chakra, opposite the heart position. At the same time, the heart sends out these radiant, these rays, if you will, of the circulatory vessels that spatialize where the vertebrae are gonna form down the back of this tube that's forming. And then it wraps around itself and incorporates the heart, grows down below it, and then, grows around the yolk sac, pulling that in as the gut tube. So it's this exquisite tubular networking that self assembles, we all assemble ourselves. And once the heart is incorporated and it's animated the diaphragm forming, the face then unfolds from it, up from it. And this exquisite dance is then animated by six buds that grow in the following orders. First, the lungs around the heart as the arms and hands form around the outside of the torso, which we're going to look at in a little bit of detail. And then some three embryological days later, 
the legs begin to grow from this lower aspect of the tubular network. And it's the most fascinating dance to consider in, in detail. I was very lucky to work with Jörg van der Waal, who will become key to this story a little bit later on. So in order to understand the hands, they grow out from the sides of the body, originally as paddles, but what's going to be the fingers first. And if we look at the next slide, you can see they grow out as paddles of different textures. Within them, the different textures are marked in these drawings. And what actually happens if you look at your hands, so I invite you all to spread your hands out in front of you and have a look at them. And imagine they were inside a sock. And what actually happens is something called cell apoptosis is a, a, a cell, it's cell death in fact. The, the cells between what are going to become the fingers uh, basically commit suicide in a way, but they know where they are and they know what they're supposed to, to do. They're programmed to form four spaces. So what you see as five fingers, and indeed a little later, what you see as five toes is in fact four spaces. And this is still a liquid crystal matrix inside an almost transparent tubular network. And if we move to the next slide, what we will see is how this actually forms so that although the hands grow out straight from the side, they spiral in around the heart. So the hands wrap the heart and they form different densities inside this tubular network that through use densifies to become what we call bone, which is basically fascia with hydroxyapatite in it as a response to our environment. So it's a responsive architectural material. So if we want to consider what that material looks like in the superficial body, we can have a look at the next slide, which has been allowed by Jean-Claude Gamberteau. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude, for letting us use this. This is one of his exquisite images of the tensioned nature of the fascia under the skin. This is the superficial fascia, but the fascia is formed under tension everywhere in the body. And in the next slide, what we're going to see is a piece of work done by John Sharkey which is the first time in the world this has been shown, uh, is the, the images are in my book and I'm incredibly proud to be able to show them. Basically what John organized were MRI scans of a living female, her thigh, and these MRI scans through work at Oxford University was, were rendered in 3D silicon. And what you're seeing here is the fascia of the intermuscular septi of the thigh, the fascia in between the muscles. But of course, as we saw in the previous slide, the fascia actually takes up all the space. It's just that it couldn't be rendered any smaller than this. So at this level, you're seeing the fascia and the fascia with hydroxyapatite, the bone, but you're not seeing the muscle or the myofascia that would be in between, which is what we usually study. And this is throughout the whole body and it's formed under tension. So if we come away from the slides now, and we can go back to them in a minute, we could perhaps do a little practice just for 10 minutes of, what, of showing what that actually means, how we experience it. Would that be okay with you, Elizabeth? Great. So what I wanted you to do was realize that if you were to put your hand inside a glove, and I've got a just an ordinary surgical glove here, that this paddle comes out of the side of the body and it tensions. If you pull on it, what happens is, if you're doing this with me, as you pull on it, if you don't pull too hard so it tears, but you pull hard enough that it tensions, I've just torn it, of course, you find that this actually rounds towards the heart. So the body is already under tension at all times, it grows out as the embryo. I might be able to show this to you if I do it like this. So it grows out from the center and remains under tension all the time. So what emerges when that cell apoptosis takes place is this constantly under tension, always held by the tissue it grew out from 
which was from the spine and from the torso. So all the nerves, all the circulatory vessels and all the tissues of this upper portion of the spine are all grown under tension. They are elastically tensioned in a way. They're not elasticated, but they have elastic energy. They have recoil energy to form what we call our hand. And we know that because if we cut ourselves, a cut doesn't just lie there like a line, it forms a mandala shape because it's always under tension. So we now understand that the fascia everywhere in the body is a tension compression network, which is how come we have such dexterity at the end of our fingers. And if we think about it, we use our hands all the time to express ourselves. And we have this incredible ability to tension, to tighten and to compress our hands and to change the tension compression relationships. So let's just see what that means. Come with me and imagine that you are scooping water with your hands, but all you want to do is splash your face with it. So you can use your hands in this lovely, soft, slightly floppy way to scoop water, splash your face, and it's a lovely, soft, round, free gesture where we simply scoop and splash. And it's really easy. And these fingers are lovely and soft. And what actually distinguishes our nervous system from that of other species of mammal is our ability to touch a pose, as it's called, our fingers and thumb. This is a very sophisticated ability. So we use this spiraling nature of our hands that came out straight and spiraled or chiraled into position. And we can spiral them and make this splashing motion with our hands. Now let's imagine that rather than splashing our face with the water, we wanted to drink that water. So join with me in making the same scooping gesture but this time, when you join your little fingers and your hand, you're going to squeeze them together and press them and press all the fingers together because you can to make your hands into a bowl. And then you can imagine lifting that to your mouth and drinking from it because you've stiffened the architecture in such a way that you can change along a spectrum from softness to stiffness. And that spectrum is the spectrum of a liquid crystal soft matter tubular network, which is what you are. And one of the things that's really shifted in this new paradigm of bodywork that the fascia has brought us into, which is explained throughout the book and put into practice at the end, is that we move, we think, we feel, we sense on a spectrum from softness of our superficial fascia, which you can feel if you roll your skin on the back of your hand, it glides, it's a bit like egg white under there, all the way through to the bony network, and you can feel the bones in your forearm quite easily. And even though that's relatively hard compared to this soft tissue, it's nevertheless harder soft matter. And we've inherited the biomechanics and the anatomy and physiology of 16th, 17th and 18th century hard matter physics. And we've been using it to explain our bodies as if we move levers at joints in flat planes that divide us in half. There is no symmetry, there are no flat planes and there are no levers in nonlinear biologic forms. And as Robert Schleit writes so clearly, just because it's popular doesn't mean it's true. And this is the paradigm that we're crossing as we understand how the fascial matrix works throughout the body because it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. One particular area that Jan Trawolfer has taken this forward in and understanding from a biotensical point of view how we're under tension is scar tissue. And what I have here is a sock and a sock is a wonderful example if you're showing your clients what we're talking about because you can show so easily, this one's got a hole in it, sorry, pretend it hasn't, how this is under tension because by pulling on the sock, you can actually move the arm under tension. And what I wanted to show you was this brilliant darm because this is how scar tissue behaves in the, in the tissue. It loses its flexibility, its pull 
because here it has a different texture. And this is how scar tissue behaves differently under tension to other areas of the body. So this really can help you give people and your clients in the simplest of ways this sense that the sock has a weave, it has a different tensional pull in different directions. But we have to remember that we are under tension in 360 degrees, but we're under tension compression as they organize. Now, what that does is it gives us the ability to change the tension compression organization throughout the body. And most of you will have heard of myofascial release. So this is where we're going to pick up our ball. And I've got here, I've got a tennis ball. I've got a little golf flight ball, which is a lovely small polystyrene ball. These are for practicing learning to play golf. You can use a squash ball. And then there's all the other lovely myofascial release ball that some of my very beloved colleagues work with in the world. Please, whatever you have. And we're going to look at this very briefly from two different points of view. Very often, the main one we consider is myofascial release. So that is where we press. We compress the ball into our tissues, and please do it with me now, where we can roll the ball over the muscles of the hand, the thenar and hyperthenar muscles, and up through the fingers. And this can be really lovely if you spend a lot of time at your computer, or you walk dogs and have your hands held in leads, or you drive a lot, anything that you use your hands for, particularly if it's repetitive, these are the most beautiful ways of releasing the possibility of repetitive strain injuries. Because what we're doing is we're hydrating the tissue, we're reorganizing it, and it's lovely to work with the ball between the hands rather than on the ground. I often see people teaching this as roll the ball on the ground. And I find people can tend to push too hard as if harder and more is better. What we want to notice is that the tissue has a sensitivity on a spectrum from very, very subtle to very, very strong. Same as it is very, very soft, to comparatively hard. This is its nature. It is sensory in nature. It is the foundation of our largest sensory organ of the body, the fascial matrix, the basis of our haptic perception. So when you're using two hands, it tends to be more instinctively good for you. You don't press too hard. And I invite you to roll the ball and include up and down the arms, and over the backs of the hands, which often get left out because we can get ever so carried away with the palm of the hand, but it's also the back of the hand, the arm, and all the way up the arm. So by doing that, we animate the tissues, we rehydrate the tissues, we redistribute the forces between the tissues, and we encourage the tissue to talk back in a lovely, free, playful language to us, because if we listen in, we can hear it. That's the first one. The second way of working with the ball is very different. I invite you to consider using the ball as lightly as you can. How little do you need to hold the ball? How little pressure can you use? And it's surprisingly difficult to do this as you move the ball up and down the arms and roll the hands over each other. How lightly can you hold it? And believe it or not, the smaller and lighter the ball, the harder it is to do this. Now, I have had the most beautiful results working with older people and also working with people who have fibromyalgia. Just by doing this with the hands and the forearms, it changes the signaling through the tensional network all the way back to the heart, which is where the arms originally grew from. And if we breathe gently, or indeed we hum, or chant, or tone, we can use the sound current to resonate softly, or you can just play music and have people humming and singing along to the music while they do this really, really softly the most extraordinary things can happen through asking the question as you move and work around the arms and hands and along the fingers, how subtly can I feel this? 
How gently can I do this? How softly can I move? And indeed you can use different balls of different textures because this tissue is under tension like the strings of an instrument or the drum skin of a drum. It's actually resonating this subtle language back through the whole body, back to the heart, back to the vagus nerve, and it's calming the whole system. So it becomes a sort of movement meditation. Joe, I think that you're, um, you've just suggested ways that we, we can um, so readily transform our personal uh, practice experience and also professional efficacy. Um, now for the next sensory experience. <laughs> well, if you could show the slide, Hillary, just to make a segue for us. This slide is uh, a picture of, of Helen Eady, who was modeling inside a tube. So this was another tube. This was given to me by Trudy Austin when and we were both there, Elizabeth, in Canada, when out of this it grew out of basically me having a rant that we we sit in all these conferences and we get numb tailbones while we talk about movement. And of course, movement is not an intellectual process. And when you've spent 20, 30 years doing yoga and you want people to move, trying to explain fascia technically and not having people experience the feeling is like, Grr. so this whole um, uh, summit came out of this conversation. Wilbur Kelsick and John Sharkey uh, set up the Canadian Biotensegrity uh, Summit. And Trudy Austin gave me this tube, which is like the other tubes that you saw, but this one is it's brown and, and it's got, so you can see white cells. And what it shows is as Helen was moving, the shape of the cells moved. And this is how the body operates, the organelles within the cell, the cells within the organs, the organs within the organism, in that we are constantly changing, constantly moving. The tension compression architecture, the tubular networks are in a constant flow and they have what we call emergent properties. And people often say to me, what do you mean by emergent properties? And the thing about emergent properties is the easiest way to explain it is by understanding that the fascia is a liquid crystal matrix and a liquid crystal matrix that you're all very familiar with, if we can see the next slide, is none other than chocolate. And I spent the first 20 years of my life as a chocolatier. I did yoga during that time. I had absolutely no idea that I was learning how to be elbow deep in uh, a liquid crystal matrix and through learning how it behaves. Uh, and this is how I, I teach through the five T's of understanding chocolate, that it has emergent properties depending on its type, its temper, it, i.e. its temperature, but we, in, in, in the body we translate that into temperament, its temperature, its tempo, and it's timing, it's temporality. And I'll quote John Sharkey here, your fascia is your tissue of temporality. It not only tells the time in your body, but it heals in different places over different time frames, and it behaves differently in time. Now, what's that got to do with chocolate? Well, a great deal. Chocolate is structurally sensitive to subtle change. And all those subtle changes have to come together in the right time, in the right way, in order to be the hard snapping crystalline nature that we want our chocolate to be. But in the next slide, you're gonna see what we have to do to get it like that. And this is a picture of melted chocolate that my son's father is tempering on a sheet of marble. And you can just see his hand at the back with a, with a slab. This is the traditional artisan way in which we temper chocolate. It's usually done by machine, but we, we know how to do it by hand. And basically we move it around and we have to keep it moving. It has to stay in a relatively liquidish state. So it's not unbound fluid. Urine is the only unbound fluid in your body. Everything else in your fluid is a bound liquid crystal. Every other fluid in your body, your blood is connective tissue, your, your, everything in you, the, the synovial fluid, everything in your body is a bound water, a bound special type of water. It's 
bound water bound liquid crystal as is chocolate and what that means is by moving it around Malcolm is making sure that it is tempered at exactly the right temperature so that it will then crystallize so that the emergent properties will come together and make the shape that we want it to which is exactly what we want to do when we're moving so if we come out of those slides now I'm going to tell you a goofy silly story about chocolate and you could bring your chocolate out. Um, chocolate became very important to me when uh, Leonid Blyum, my friend and colleague who understands cerebral palsy like no other man on earth and makes a huge difference in the lives of many children by so doing, introduced me to Yarp van der Waal in person and Yarp was sitting at the table in Belgium and he was opening a little chocolate piece that was with his coffee because we were in the Belgian Fascia Congress. I hope you don't mind me telling you this silly story. Yup, I hope you'll forgive me. You know how much I love you. And he was unwrapping his chocolate and I hope your chocolate does this. So take a piece of your chocolate and see, put it by your ear and listen and see, listen rather than see if it snaps. You should have a snap. And having spent 20 years as a chocolatier, what we would have done in the chocolate laboratory is we would have taken a spatula, a steel spatula, and we would have dipped it in the chocolate and put it in the fridge to check that all the temperatures, the heating, the cooling, is it snapping? There you go. It's maybe a little warm. <laughs> it's got to be just right. And it snaps. <laughs> there it I have, I, I have it snaps, but uh, Joe, uh, Joe, it's a different sound resonance. Oh yeah, as I... you get smaller and smaller, it changes. <laughs> okay, well, carry on. What, what's Yap doing there with your chocolate? So he was unwrapping this chocolate, and I didn't realize, but I was staring at him like a, a rude child, and I couldn't take my eyes off this chocolate because in the lab, what we do to check that it's right, we take it out of the fridge and we take it off the back of the spatula and we snap it. And that's how we know from an artisan point of view that it's all going to be fine when we mold with it. It's going to demold in the shape that we want it to be. And you've got no idea what goes into making the chocolates that you buy in the shop, the artisan chocolates, all these bars. It's just incredible. Every single emergent property has to come together to make the move you want to make. Hello. Think of what we have to do. We have to eat right. We have to sleep right. We have to think right. We have to pray right. We have to do the right practice for our form. And all of that magic comes together. Anyway, so Yart was just snapping this chocolate and I was staring and he went, oh, I'm so sorry. And he offered it to me. I said, I don't want your chocolate. And he looked at me and I looked at him and Leonid said, I think you were staring. And I went, oh, I'm so sorry, I do apologize. I said, I can't help it. I was a chocolatier for 20 years and I was watching it the snap. And I thought, oh my God, and I shut my eyes thinking how rude I'd been. And when I opened them, Yarp was on his knees next to my chair. And he looked up at me and he said, Juliette Binoche, who was the star of the film Chocolatier. And I didn't know that Yarp is a chocoholic. So for all my years of desperately trying to study embryology and being helped and trained by YARP and Professor Daryl Evans, it all counted for nothing because my claim to fame is chocolate. But what I do want to invite you to do is eat it and hum and mmm and make lovely noises to yourselves because none of us can hear you as you do. So we're going to have a tiny bit, Elizabeth. I know we both don't eat chocolate, but... I mean, seriously, I we, we, yeah, I, we, just once. We, 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 have we to. can't. <laughs> I have to. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So one of the things I want you to do is really feel the subtlety of flavor because your fascia has a great deal to do with that as well. And I thought we would finish. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Don't rush, Joe, really save mm -mm. it. And, uh, well, you know, Leon you, 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 you could get your hands in the mix too, you know, the hands, the chocolate. Well, if you hold them too long, exactly, you end up, mm, mm -mm. <laughs> and the thing is, your tongue is an extension of your heart. Your, your, your pericardium and your tongue are all one piece. If you didn't know that, you should know that. And your vagus nerve down here, and Leon Chetel wrote a beautiful paper called Humming My Way Back Home, and he was in Dublin with John Sharkey. And he'd left there and gone home 
humming produces nitric oxide in the body, by the way. And it's fabulous. And if you think about it, all our vocal cords are strung under tension. So when we're enjoying this, mm, 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 and I don't have to speak because you can get what, mm, mm, oh, I love it. And you have to go like that with your hands because you have to do, mwah. see, this is a hand gesture of, mwah. You, you see, you can't explain it. It's not an intellectual process, is it? Is it? Mwah. Mm, mm. That is Peruvian single origin, serious chocolate. Don't get me on that subject. I'll be here for weeks. Mm -mm. And you go, mm. you're actually calming yourself down. You're actually having a physiological effect on your tissue throughout your whole form. And that brings us to a lovely thing I thought we could do as a close is a mudra. Because mudra are hand gestures in yoga is a mudra for peace to all nations. So just while we're thinking about our hands, just you could think of that as a mudra, as a mwah, I love you, mwah, and I mwah, love this chocolate, I have to say. Can you imagine? My son was traumatized when he found out that his parents had a chocolate factory before he was born. Can you imagine? He never got over it. And we can bring our hands to our heart, which is a gesture that we very often make as one meaning, I love you. And another gesture that we're very familiar with is prayer, sometimes called, I've heard it called Angelo Midra, meaning Mudra of the angels. So I'm gonna invite you to bring in the light and place your hands in prayer. And I'm going to show you a mudra for world peace or peace to all nations. I just wanna say about resonance that in my work in spiritual sciences, we're very clear that the resonance that we put out reflects like as if we are an antenna to the resonance we get back. The sound we make with our voices it can soothe our own hearts. It can also soothe others. And all of you know, if you teach movement or you do manual work, just the sound of your voice can actually calm your client and bring them into a sense of safety as it can bring you into a sense of safety. Something that I think is really worth remembering in these times where there's a lot of uncertainty and we need to feel safe. And this gesture is a very simple gesture. I'm gonna turn slightly so you can see what I'm doing with my hands. My thumbs are together and each of my fingers are touching each other palm to palm, prayer. And then we're just gonna turn the right hand towards us at 90 degrees. That's all you're gonna do. So from prayer to swiveling the hands on each other just slightly. So they just go like that. And then with the right hand closest to your body, Place your hands like that. So you've gone from prayer, you've swiveled and turned. Prayer position, twist the hands and bring the right hand closest to the body. And let's say a prayer together and send out a resonance from around the world because no doubt we're all listening in from all over the world. That we ask for the light and the sound from the highest source. We ask that anything that is not for our highest good be lifted, transmuted and dispersed back into the nothingness from which it came. And in its place, each one of us, from wherever we are in this collective web of resonance, let's consider that the dark matter of the universe is the fascia of the inner cosmos. That from our place in the web, we send out a prayer of peace to all nations, and so may it be, amen. Thank you for having me. Namaste, which means the divine in me salutes the divine in you. Thank you. Joe, thank you. And thank you for bringing us this, this very unique experience of your second edition 
and our transformative um, movement practice, sensory and movement practice. Um, let's open it up now to questions and to discussion. Um, now's the perfect time for that. Um, we'll lead off with a, a comment from uh, Katerina Patterson that uh, Joe, you may be able to uh, speak to. She's, uh, she's Katerina says that she recently uh, heard um, that there are lots of estrogen receptors in our mouth. And she wonders if that's why women like chocolate so much. Do you have any responses to that? Wow, um, I hadn't heard that. And I think uh, yeah, I meet two kinds of people, those that love chocolate and those that don't. And I have to say those that don't are very few and far between. And my experience of being at a dinner party when somebody says, what do you do? And you answer, I'm a chocolatier. It was a conversation stopper. I mean, everybody, you know, wanted to, it's like you've got this magical access to something. You do actually, chocolate is it's a very magical thing. And in fact, money grows on trees is an expression that came from people who had cocoa plantations because it was a license to print money apparently, but it's a completely organic, natural product when properly used. Um, but as to the estrogen, I find that fascinating because I think we're just beginning to uncover what our new understanding of the fascia brings to us. And we know that the skin, that the, the skin is the largest uh, so-called organ of the body, I suppose. But we, we're basically a toroidal tube. If you think about from, from the mouth to the anus is a wiggly gut tube. We're a, like a torus, like a donut with a very wiggly hole down the middle that juices. What goes in gets juiced and, you know, it juices what comes out is pulp and pee and the rest is what we live on we are what we eat so i don't know if that relates chocolate to estrogen it's fascinating but i think we're just beginning to learn how much more sensitive we are to fine detail and microbiomes and minutiae and subtle nuances through the skin and the sensory awareness because of course the other thing about the chocolate is got cocoa mass cocoa butter in it if it's dark tiny bit of sugar and it used to be treated as more precious than gold when chocolate was first discovered it was drunk in a slightly liquid slightly melted form in golden goblets it was called zocoalt spelt with an x and you it would you would drink it and throw the goblet away I mean, it was so precious. I just think that the feminine wisdom appreciates grace and beauty in nature at a level that is just beyond beyond, as the feminine aspect of any male can too. It may be the feminine aspect. I say that very carefully. I, I, we were all the feminine and the masculine, the tension and the compression, the sensory, subtle perception. So I, I think you'll find there's an awful lot of men that like chocolate. That's the thing, Katerina. Um, Joe, there's also a, a, a question. Uh, please, would you tell us the Sanskrit name for the, um, the mudra that you uh, uh, taught us for world peace? I don't know. It wasn't given to me in Sanskrit. It was given to me by, no, I don't have it. Peace to all humanity. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So just so you know, mudras uh, are considered in, in the ancient schools as being something that is activated and awoken in you rather than taught to you. And um, while we have suggestions of very beautiful mudras that we can do that guide us into different aspects of self-awareness, it's a little bit like yoga. You do you and I do me. And I was trained in the work of Vanda Scaravelli and Vanda didn't want yoga to be called Scaravelli yoga. She asked very specifically that we recognize that our own practice is our own. So I say the same for the mudras, although I, in my experience, it's extremely useful to teach people a much more sensitive awareness of their hands. The meaning we can bestow on each mudra is sometimes a kind of a gentle correlate. And there's something very powerful about hundreds of people around the world doing the same gesture. So there is a demeanor where everyone is calling in a sense of peace for all nations with the same gesture, just as wherever you go in the world, this gesture 
is one of respect. The, the namaste gesture, the very beautiful gesture of respect, and it's a very typical gesture of prayer. Um, but that doesn't mean you can only pray with your hands in this position. I sometimes find myself, if I'm praying to for somehow feeling contained and together, I find this position very comforting while I'm chanting or toning or whatever yoga I'm doing on that particular occasion. So I invite you to consider the same. And I was given that by my master and I wasn't given a Sanskrit name for it. Lovely question though, I'd love to know what that is. Yes. Um, uh, carrying the, the liquid crystal um, further, uh, further forward, um, Alison Marsh, who's an, an, a movement expert um, in Pilates for pre and postnatal, um, asks, please could you speak to diastasis recti, the linea alba, and the abdominal wall's ability to uh, regenerate, her words, over time? Do our tendinous structures regenerate more than previously thought? So that's the question as written, and uh, please uh, speak it's to a, that. It's a fabulous question. Uh, in fact, I've, I've just been working with somebody with quite severe issues after two years. So diastasis recti, if there's anybody listening doesn't know what it is, is basically something that happens in pregnancy when the rectus abdominis muscle is either torn or pulled too far. And what this speaks to is our understanding of stretching. Um, and this is a word that is used by many people in many different ways to apparently mean many different things. You saw what happened when I put my hand in the glove and I just pulled too hard, I tore the tissue. And the word stretch literally means beyond physiological range. So the human body, you can see in this tube, the fascia of every tube, that is the fibrils, the muscle fibers, the muscles, the, the tunicae of the blood vessels, the dura of the nerves, is covered in this tubing that is basically fascia wrapped one way and another way to create a tube. So you can see it doesn't pull this way very much, but it does this way, which is why we have a, uh, a spiral way of it moving in one particular direction. Now, what that basically means is it has a weave and that weave has an inherent elasticity. It's like a spring and we're designed to be in the middle. We're pre-tensioned. So we're in the middle of the spring loading. And if we over pull that spring loading and take it beyond physiological range so it can't spring back, that's permanent. At one level, that's permanent. So stretch marks, even if you don't appear to have them on the outside of your skin in pregnancy, trust me, in dissection, we see them on the inside. They are stretch marks where the skin can't restore. However, the actual torso is made up of obviously the obliques, transversus abdominis, rectus abdominis, and those sheets and sheaths of the fascia can be rebalanced to optimum support. And if we, for example, as, as the client I saw earlier today, used to have Olympic athletic levels of fitness, and when she gave birth the first time, ripped just the top, but the second time the whole linear alba was damaged. Um, we're not going to be able to completely restore that and regrow tendons. But if we understand how to rebalance the whole tubular network, and it's much more complicated than that, but it, it can be done with very, very subtle, slow, we have healing breaths, we have subtle movements, we have a suite of the most gentle exercise techniques to bring back an improved sensory connectivity for the whole tubular network. And I've seen people two, five, 12 years after pregnancy using these particular subtle breathing techniques and building on them very, very slowly where we, where, where we just work with the breath, then we add a very slight movement of the pelvis, then we add the knee, we add the arm. That's a, that's a whole webinar. Um, but they're very subtle things that I'm sure you do, but by building them very, very slowly, we have a lot more hope for restoring the wholeness of the tissue. But I also recommend that if 
that person is going to run or they're going to ride a horse or they want to do something that puts very fast forces and impact through their tissue, they shouldn't imagine they can restore it entirely to its original form. They should add some support to that. There's a great deal you can do, but I think we, it really behoves us to use the subtle distinctions of building gradually and restore or moving towards restoration and certainly the new uh, information that we have suggests new over the last five years suggests that we can do much more than we thought. I hope that answers the question. Joe, prior to continuing with the with the questions and questions slash comments in the chat, let's take a look at the slide that shows how people can order your book, getting the uh, the substantial discount uh, for your book. Handspring is offering a twenty percent off. Um, through the end of August, so through August 31, on Joanne's gorgeous book, Yoga, Fascia, Anatomy, and Movement, the second edition. And you can see on your screen the code that you use at checkout, which is MTL, stands for Moved to Learn, 1920. Uh, we'll also bring to your attention that Joe is, is uh, kicking off our uh, second season that next Wednesday uh, on Wednesday September 15th a month from now Bill Harvey who is the author of Breathing Mudras and Meridians Direct Experience of Embodiment will follow on this uh, magic carpet that Joe has launched today. Now um, Joe let's get back to some uh, more discussion and the the questions that have, or the comments that have come up in the chat. Um, there is Doug Bolson asks if you would uh, repeat for us uh, slowly, uh, because it was a, uh, a lot of significant words and phrases. Uh, what he says is your description of us, which says something like a liquid crystal tensioned tubular network, which you, you string <laughs> your beautiful words oh, yeah. together uh, mm -hmm. well I, I said i think i said that we are the architect that self-assembles the architecture in order to express ourselves as the architect in this soft matter bound liquid crystal medium that has different textures on a spectrum of fluid to firm let's think of the bones which we can bend and manipulate a little if we know what we're doing to great effect, I might add, um, on, on that spectrum that we, we are this bound liquid crystal matrix. And if I can go one step further, since you asked, I actually think the fascia is the interface of spirit animating the pattern of our matter. That pattern is very specific. It's a pattern that we see in the embryo. It's a pattern of the geometry of our form. It's a pattern we see throughout nature. Cellulose to a plant is fascia to a human. And that matrix has a particular pattern. It, it's an irregular pattern of uh, all in the geometric ratios of the planets to each other, of, of parts of us to ourselves. It's all in Vitruvian man in Leonardo's work, Leonardo da Vinci's work. And what's so fascinating is that the study of, of consciousness of that pattern, that it, it's all there, all the known crystalline networks in nature. And so when I say the spirit with which we do something, I'm talking about the aliveness, I'm talking about the dynamism, I'm not talking about religion or anything like that. I'm saying that which animates us, that which we call ourselves into form because we self-assemble, self-develop, we are self-motivated is the pattern of our matter animated by that spirit. The word matter comes from mater. The word pattern comes from pater. The word father mother symbolizes the feminine and the masculine, the ida, the pingala, the yin, the yang, the tension compression. And so by bringing an understanding of how tension compression interface, but how we have the power to change them moment to moment in their relationships to each other, brings forth the emergent properties that we manufacture, generate, create, co-create with our tissue 
all the time as beings in bodies because that's what we are we're self-motivated beings in bodies animating this liquid crystal constantly changing matrix the mother matrix it, matrix means mother and i know that's a bit longer than what i said before but i can wax lyrical about that forever because it's what my doctorate's in <laughs> and i believe it or not study this geometry all the time thank you joe and thank you for illuminating um ours um with yours um sherry broman um also has a a question, yes, and and she's uh, continuing the the question about the uh, the response of the tissues to pregnancy, and then taking it further. Uh, what about scar tissue that is deep in pelvic floor uh, muscles? You made some great uh, question an, uh, allusion yeah. to Jan Trevor's book. Yeah, I did, and uh, yes, uh, it, actually, just so I just want to be really clear, my book doesn't refer specifically to postpartum and pregnancy. It's much more general than that. It's much more the story of the history of how fascia was missed, why we have to incorporate it, how it translates into biomechanics of all movements, and then we turn it completely practical. And I also talk a lot about a lot of the protagonists in the field and what we what we can make the work mean. And I, I hope the book is something that facilitates each of your practices, be they movement or manual, so that you can make sense of new things and also next year, I'm doing a, a masterclass online that's going to be devoted to postpartum. I have some wonderful colleagues who are doing beautiful work in that. So, so look out for that. Um, but in answer to your question about things like episiotomies and uh, abdominal scars, um, there is some very beautiful research. A lot of it's been harnessed in Jan Trawarthur's book, Scars, Adhesions and the Biotensegral Body, where we know that very, very subtle touch, and I mean very subtle, like we were doing, that how lightly can we touch and still feel this, has the most amazing effect on all scars. doesn't matter where they are. But very often, and I won't go into this, but I just mention it when you're working with episiotomy scars or anything, that uh, mastectomies as well is another area where uh, scar tissue is part of the story, but it's also part of a process of fear or self-consciousness or not knowing who to go to or where to go to them. And sometimes uh, and a C-section scar, I mean, you know, is one of the first things we work on in, in structural integration is if somebody comes with a C-section scar, teach them how to treat it. And very, very subtle touch actually animates the fascia to speak its language. It speaks the body's language. Your body doesn't speak English, right? Your body speaks in very subtle sound currents and light currents. We know that fascia conducts light at the most minute biophotonic particle, particles. It's gold standard peer-reviewed research on it. It's in the book. And it also conducts sound through the body as resonance. And so we can use resonance medicine I use frequency specific microcurrent, Dr. Carolyn at Makin's work, uh, to resolve. I say resolve, not dissolve. I recently saw an Instagram post about how you can dissolve scars. Please don't be ridiculous. You can't dissolve a scar. You can reintegrate scar tissue marvelously, even decades later. The tissue is always responsive, it is your living matrix. And if you speak to it wisely, using touch as one of your talking skills, you can transform what we think it does into what we can animate. And magic can happen if you know what you're doing and you remain respectful. And that doesn't mean sometimes that you don't need surgery. Surgery and scars can save lives. Let's be clear. But what we can also do is understand what to do with them so we're not left with the difficulties of scar tissue that we thought were just a necessary consequence of surgery. What we're now knowing and learning is that we can make the most fantastic difference to people for them and to them. Beautiful. Joe, um, Jan, yes. Tawartha, Jan Tawartha has a, a, a question and a comment in the Q&A and I'll read it, uh, Joe. I think the exercise with the ball lightly rolling around the forearm and hands would be really useful for self-harm scars in that it lifts the heart 
as well as applies light touch to the scars in a non-intrusive way. What do you think? 100% I'm with you, Jan. That's exactly what I suggest to people in that situation. The other aspect that I also get them to do is to lift their hands up in front of their face. So their hands are crossing over with the eyes. So right hand, left hand, and then they cross over. And what that can sometimes do is give people who are in an agitated place a more calm, there's lots of brain gym stuff that we won't go into, but it allows them this crossing over, they go into a kind of meditative state while you're teaching them how to do it. It can be very, very beautiful. And I agree, and I'm so thrilled you're here, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia has uh, two uh, two comments in the Q and A. We've had a a very act. We have a very active chat, and uh, the Q and A is uh, coming up as well. So from Felicia, um, she says um, trigger points and fascia. Can you give a quick explanation on it? I can with pleasure. I uh, I loved discovering when I was trained in structural work trigger points everywhere. And I, I met in Germany where I was teaching the wife of Norbert Becker, Dr. Norbert Becker, who is a orthopedic surgeon who 25, probably 35 years ago now, he promised to lay down his knife. He was an orthopedic surgeon, fully qualified in Germany, highest level. And he decided to see what he could do to help people by putting his knife away and working in means other than surgically. And his practice has been full there's queues down the road ever since and I arrived in Germany and he said to me would you do something for me with your structural work would you work on my wife because she's got something going on with her shoulder and um I we, we have a thing that you don't work on your next of kin because it just doesn't usually work because you're so you so want them to get better and you feel so bad if they don't so anyway I worked on his wife and there were like a little mass of trigger points little knots in the tissue little spirals they're like they're just like sweet wrappers. Like, you know, when you see little sweets with a wrapper, it's like a little, anyway, I could feel them and I worked with her for a while and we did some movement and I was teaching her yoga there. So that's why I was there. And then we, we did the yoga and then we did some more treatment and, and it was marvelous. And he said to me, well, what did you do? I said, well, I don't know what I'm trained to do. And he said, well, did you use trigger points? And I said, I suppose. And he said, well, do you mean these? And he got out uh, Travell and Simons, well, it's actually Travell and Simons and Simons, myofascial trigger points, because David, Dr. David Simons had a brother. And anyway, he opened this chart and there's this very specific spots where the myofascial trigger points are designated to be. And if you learn where they are, then you can diagnose somebody who has fibromyalgia, for example, if they have 11 of the 18 trigger points, for example. And I sat there and I thought, oh, God. Now I'm in trouble because I can't name every single one of those myofascial trigger points. Oops. But I got rid of the shoulder pain. So I was like, oh, well, something else to learn. And I came home feeling quite miserable that maybe my work wasn't really very good and I didn't know the trigger points and whatever. And then I met John Sharkey. And John Sharkey personally worked with Dr. David Simons. He was, David, Dr. Simons was John's mentor and he was, his partner was Dr. Carolyn McMakin of FSM that I mentioned earlier. So it's all very, thoroughbred knowledge and John worked very closely with them and Dr. David Simons and the first thing he said was x does not mark the spot and I just followed that sentence and I sat there going please tell me what you mean and he said well you can feel the sort of spiraling tissue of a myofascial trigger point is like can be anywhere in the body and moreover in understanding pain and nociception what we can understand is they can mimic all kinds of different pain patterns in the body when they are resident and stuck I'm paraphrasing very badly this is a whole training in neuromuscular therapy but I'm just saying and that woke me up that day to the idea that x does not mark the spot because when you're trained in structural integration you go through an entire suite of tissues kind of clearing as you go and if there's a myofascial trigger point if that's what it is you clear it so you learn how to do very specific techniques for specific areas and you get a very subtle vocabulary in speaking fluent fascia and so the trigger points can be anywhere and 
the more variation you learn in how to release them. So it's not always a question of grinding with an elbow. It might just be the most subtle technique or even something as soft as working with this ball that can make that difference. And if I ask one thing of everybody in this little webinar talk to, to recognize is the spectrum from soft, subtle, fluidic nature of like egg white that you can feel on the back of your hand through to the very much more solid feeling of bone. It is all connected, it is all sensory and it has a volume control. And if you yell at someone, they tend to do this and move away from you. And if you whisper so quietly, they can't hear you, they come towards you, but they can get irritated. And all in between that spectrum is how we respond to our environment and how we respond to treatment and how the tissue responds to us. And I think what we're asking of each other, of ourselves, is this recognition of the subtlety of this spectrum. That's my invitation, including my fascial trigger points. Did that answer the question? I hope so. And Did more, Joe. thank you. <laughs> And uh, we will just uh, note that, uh, that your very good friend, colleague, and mentor and inspiration, John Sharkey, gives a comment in the chat. It was Dr. Simon's wife, who is the other Simons. You mentioned the book by Simons and Simons. Oh, I thought it was his brother. Sorry, John. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Thank you for being here. So glad he's here. <laughs> I hope you feel um, duly honored, my friend. <laughs> Joe, would you um, lead us again in closing with the, uh, the mudra for world peace? Because we're at the end of the hour plus 11 minutes. My joy. <laughs> Are you inviting me, Elizabeth, for another prayer? Little one. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Crack me up. So we've got our hands in the prayer position or what we would use for namaste, meaning the divine in me salutes the divine in you, which it does. Given that we are all made up of the so-called divine ratio. Sometimes it's called the golden ratio if you don't want to sound like you're all floaty, but I am. And we simply twist the hands like that and place the right hand on the body. So the right hand's closest. And let's just take a moment to breathe together. Take a lovely breath in and an easy breath out. And I think there's a saying somewhere that the finest prayer is thank you. And I just invite us all to take a moment to consider that gratus is the Latin source or origin of both the words gratitude and the word grace. So let us just take a moment to say thank you for our health, for our bodies, for our breath, for our lives. And we ask of the highest source to hear our prayer for peace to all nations. And given that we do this from the tissue of time, I know we don't know how long it might take. However, let's pray for it anyway and say thank you for the peace that we have and that we can create. For ourselves. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Joe. A pleasure to be with you. And thank you to all who joined us. Carry forth with your mudras, your prayers, your chocolate. <laughs> and your books. And we'll look forward to being with you next month in September with Bill Harvey. Thank you all. Bye for now. <laughs>